our most mature experiment to date uh, is one in Freetown, Sierra Leone. It consists of uh, covering the roofs of single buildings in uh, like uh, low-income districts and to look at the impact of indoor temperature and also roof temperatures. And uh, to our surprise, we were quite surprised by the observation that we were able to cool the inside of buildings by 7 degrees Celsius on really hot days. to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Charles, and I'm very happy to welcome back Dr. Yi Tao. So I want to say a few words about uh, Dr. Tao. Uh, in 2020, he founded the MIR project. MIR stands for MIR Earth Energy Rebalance. So after uh, Dr. Tao grasped the accelerating and ultimate consequences of the climate crisis, on Earth's delicate web of life. He started MIR, and he's educated as a nanotechnologist and an instrumentation expert. He brings the benefit of a multidisciplinary background in engineering and science to problem solving. If you're new to the MIR project, you can check out our other videos on the topic, which we'll include in the description. We last spoke at COP27 and so I'm looking forward to hearing about your progress since then. Now, one of the questions I have for you, maybe we can start at a high level, was we recently had a program on Dr. James Hansen's uh, et al. paper called Global Warming in the Pipeline, which highlights the Earth's energy imbalance. Can you talk about how Mir tries to address some of this imbalance? Uh, well, thanks for the, the question. I'm very happy to be with the viewers again to give an update on the project. Uh, so more or less, generally speaking, um, I was inspired to do this project back in 2018-2019, uh, starting to think about the issue in 2017, because I did more or less the same analysis that uh, Dr. Hansen and his team presented. So uh, we arrived at the same conclusion that uh, legacy greenhouse gases uh, are sufficient to drive further warming and that we're looking at by our analysis like seven or eight degrees of further warming if the the total forcing were kept constant but of course in natural systems uh, the amount of gas can decrease or increase due to uh, natural feedbacks or uh, you know other ecosystem uh, activities so but assuming that somehow the forcing and concentrations were kept fixed we already knew back in 2019 that that was the case. So realizing that uh, was the actual motivation, one of the major ones behind me uh, abandoning my original field of low temperature physics, material science, to uh, devote my time to try to tackle this problem using surface-based uh, reflectors. Uh, so I'm in full support of the conclusions that the team uh, of Dr. Hansen arrived at. I think we did pretty much the same analyses. Uh, so if you are interested, you can find the one uh, um, video of my lecture at uh, a nano-scientific symposium back in 2019, giving exactly the same conclusions using uh, paleoclimate data. So uh, I'm really glad that uh, a renowned scientist have come out and really is defending uh, you know, what should have been communicated um, already like about five to 10 years ago, because the data was already there, uh, some of the key ones. One of the key things I recall when I first met you in uh, 2021 at the COP in Glasgow, we talked about the aerosols and, uh, you know, the fact that when the aerosols start clearing up, that that will cause uh, a relatively abrupt temperature rise because of that, as Dr. James Hansen refers to it, the Faustian bargain we made when we started emitting fossil fuels along with the aer aerosols. And so um, can you talk to the uh, um, recent findings that the shipping, the reduction in sulfur and shipping fuels has uh, caused in terms of uh, starting to 
arrays the observed temperatures we're seeing. All right, so uh, aerosol cooling is one of these, uh, for some reason that's unknown to me, a taboo topic until very recently. So the origin of the mirror actually is due to uh, Professor Guy McPherson really promoting uh, this concept in uh, his uh, outreach efforts. The aerosols, yes. Yeah, so I first heard about uh, Guy McPherson's work uh, in maybe 2016, and that really scared the, you know, SHIT out of me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason why I looked into the field in, in the first place. And unfortunately, Guy McPherson has been uh, vilified a lot uh, in both the scientific and uh, public fields, which I think is very unfortunate because we should encourage such encourage people in breaking the taboo. And more and more his predictions, although qualitative, are becoming more and more vindicated by the data. And the situation is probably worse than even he speculated. So I haven't kept up with the literature, to be honest, uh, since uh, 2021, because my previous analyses of all the data up to that point was very much sufficient to convince me of the, uh, the existence of the, the effect. And especially during uh, COVID lockdowns of 2020, after which uh, two dozen papers got published analyzing the impact of COVID lockdowns and reduction in aerosol. And I did a review talk with Jim uh, Bandel's group. If you are interested, you can search my talk with Jim Bandel. Yeah, but providing some of the studies. And I think also I also mentioned that in my uh, 2022 COP talk uh, of some of the key references resulting or enabled by the inadvertent lockdown experiment. So I haven't kept up with uh, the most recent results, but uh, and they're fully consistent with what I would expect if I were to do a secondary literature review on the problem. But I don't have access to primary data. And I have since uh, really gone back to the grassroots and really to start from, from bottom. Take the knowledge that we obtained by uh, this um, review of the different areas of study and really try to come up with solutions that are compatible with this uh, understanding. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Tao. So now I know we talked briefly yesterday and um, from our discussions, I got some ideas about some questions to ask. And I think I'm going to start with a very general question and you can expand on it as much as you like. What is uh, your method for raising dollars to fund your research? So, so far, we've been uh, fortunate enough to have just enough funding to get us started on uh, small to medium scale experiments. And they're 100% from individual donors, basically mom and pop, and basically grandparents who are concerned about the future of their, their kids, or some parents, of course. We haven't really started to do a fundraising campaign, partly because uh, nowadays it's a beauty contest out there, and 99.9% uh, .9 of the founders probably lack the technical uh, background knowledge to appreciate the need for mirror, but fortunately we have had uh, help from many generous individuals who are giving us just enough funding to keep us uh, implementing small-scale experiments to really test our hypotheses. And so far we have been able to uh, establish several small-scale experiments in the U.S. in collaboration with uh, different universities in uh, New Hampshire, uh, also with Stanford in California, which we are concluding very soon a single apartment rooftop mirror test. And now we are focusing on setting up new medium-scale experiments in uh, Western Africa and also in Tanzania starting next week and also in India. Our most mature experiment to date uh, is one in Freetown, Sierra Leone. It consists of uh, covering the roofs of single buildings in uh, like uh, low-income districts and to look at the impact of indoor temperature and also roof temperatures. And uh, to our surprise, we were quite surprised by the observation that we were able to cool the inside of buildings by 7 degrees Celsius on really hot days. And that exceeds what we read in the literature as far as white paint were concerned. So that was a welcoming result for us. And we are expanding this ex experiment from single building scale. We, we did about three, four buildings so far to a entire neighborhood covering an area of six hectares. But uh, we will try to do that in a piecewise fashion, not only because it's more logistically manageable, but that also enables answering the question of how does air temperature scale, like the 3D profile of air temperature, how does that change as a function of your surface area coverage? We know that uh, putting mirrors on surfaces will 
cool air temperature both inside the building and outside. In our first experiments in Freetown, we also had a small test building, and actually it's a school, local school, where we used different sections of the same room uh, to test different cooling surface materials and to monitor their degradation over time. Because it's then they're co-located in the same space, so they experience the same weather, same pollution uh, patterns, the same rainfall washing uh, intensity. So it's a common intercomparison small-scale uh, project. And uh, we also measure not only the uh, degradation of the surface albedo of different roofing materials over that small classroom, but also the uh, air temperature at 8 inches or 20 centimeters above the small patches of roof. Uh, each patch was roughly 10 square meters, so 100 square feet, roughly 3 by 3 meter wide to give you a sense, or 10 by 10 feet. And over such small patches, we could already measure a temperature difference of a big fraction of a degree Celsius. 0.6 on sunny days, which is more than one degree Fahrenheit. And uh, this small difference is probably due to air motion and mixing of uh, air from neighboring patches. So we're pretty certain it's a, a underestimate of the air temperature cooling that you can achieve on larger scale. So to answer the larger scale question, we have to do this on uh, multimeter, tens of meter, hundred meter scales. So that's where our current efforts lie, to try to understand the scaling uh, effect uh, more quantitatively in a real neighborhood with uh, many residents where we can also have a really beneficial impact on, that, on their lives. So from the single building experiments in Freetown, the residents really loved uh, the results and uh, we are having trouble now because every time we go into the neighborhood, the neighbors are asking us, when is our turn? When is our turn? Because uh, they see that their neighbors no longer develop heat rashes and are able to store, stay indoors, whereas they have to come out into the narrow alleys and uh, wait until sunset and three or four hours until the, the building cools down before they can enter their homes. So it's a really very visible impact on people's lives. That's why we are able to gain a community level acceptance uh, of essentially everybody on board. And uh, they, the question they have is like, when are you going to start? When are we getting our cool roof? So we should have the, we're having the the opposite problem comp compared to what we expected. It's uh, We are not able to keep up <laughs> with the demand. That's really nice to hear, and um, that's quite something. I'm going to defer another question I have in my mind, because I know when we talked yesterday, you talked a little bit about some of the challenges that you have in terms of being able to do the measurements in your community because of, you know, you're in a community. So can you talk a little bit about th some of those challenges? We are actually operating in the ground. The challenges that you find are <laughs> really different from what you expect going into the experiment. You know, originally we thought maybe it's difficult to, to convince people for buying, but now it, no, it's not. Buying is easy. Uh, but of course, we're conducting this not only as a humanitarian project. We want to really understand the uh, scientific impact and have be able to build models that can be directly used by governments to inform their decision making. Right, so we absolutely need really high quality data record time series and with really high spatial resolution. In the first phase experiment where we did the building scale uh, tests, uh, we had uh, on the order of 80 homes equipped with sensors. And each home had to be roughly three sensors. One to measure the roof temperature, another one to air temperature at maybe two meter height. And some had uh, a sensor at one meter height to, to see if there's a vertical difference in air temperature. And these sensors, by the virtue of the fact that they are indoors, were kept safe. Because we also uh, financially uh, compensate uh, the residents for uh, hosting the sensors and keeping them safe from theft. So that was pretty easy. So they both get the, the benefit of eventual uh, roof change and also some weekly uh, allowance, uh, which it's not much, but it's uh, substantial by their standards. We have to understand that many families are surviving on on the order of less than $1 per day per person. So any small help we can give uh, really means a lot to them. So the challenge comes when we are trying to address outdoor air temperature, because then you have to s put your sensors out the doors, right? And we're trying to do it at a sufficient uh, spatial density to be able to build a 3D temperature map. So we have decided to sample temperature at three different heights, one meter, two meter, and four meter above ground. 
and at uh, between 10 meters uh, lateral spacing and 20 meter lateral spacing over the six hectares. So that comes to on the order of a thousand different sensors. Yeah, so it's a really uh, nicely censored uh, experiment. And uh, these sensors, th you know, they look fancy uh, sometimes. These are gadgets that you don't see in a slum community. And there's a lot of kids, curious kids around. Every time we go in, they are curious about what is this, what is that. I'm sure many of them would uh, be unable to keep their little fingers <laughs> off of the, the sensor. So uh, there's a you know, breakage issue we have to be dealing with. So we have to redesign the different sensor holders such that they would be uh, uh, immune to accidental breakage, either intentional or just people bumping into them unintentionally because there's limited space. Right? People have to do go around our daily business. We cannot you know, interrupt people's lives. But invariably, uh, there would be individuals, even one out of a thousand, who think they might be able to make a profit by selling these, even though they don't understand what they are. So that's certainly going to happen. We already had some theft from even inside of people's homes. So we can most certainly expect theft and data loss as a result of that. So in order to minimize uh, the frequency at which we need to replace sensors and lose data, we've decided it's much better to really engage with the whole community on an individual to individual basis, uh, which really increases the, the workload for the team. We're talking about tens of thousands of people in the community. We are a team, local team of 10 people. So each person has to talk to on the order of a, a thousand different residents uh, just to explain to them who we are, why we're here, and how we are helping the community. That's on the order of uh, a couple thousand person per team member that we have to interface with. So let's say each person were able to talk to, uh, spend you know, half an hour with uh, each individual, then they can probably interface with 10 people per day. So if you count, if everybody was doing that, it's a one year long process just to talk to, to everybody and to get their inf basic information and uh, to conduct a basic uh, demographic and socioeconomic survey. Right. So there is this long preparatory phase that's inevitable when you are really conducting experiments on the ground. But it's also an uh, opportunity. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to really um, find a social science or health science um, research groups who would be a uh, interested in joining us because what we're building there is a very fertile uh, research platform, not only for physical sciences, but also for socioeconomic and uh, health science impact. Because we do know that heat will impact health. So there is a recent Nature Family Journal paper for science advances, I forgot which one, that came out using mice as models. So they reared mice uh, both at 20 degrees Celsius and also at 32 degrees Celsius. And the finding was the mice reared at 32 degrees Celsius had a 40% reduction in longevity compared to the ones reared at 20 degrees. And we mammals share many of the cellular pathways and repair mechanisms. So that could be one reason why you know there is divergent longevity in different latitudes of the planet. Basically the thermal exposure and the cellular aging and repair uh, differences. But back to the uh, experiment. So that's a reason why it's taking uh, quite substantial effort and time before we are able to uh, perform the uh, hectare scale neighborhood experiments. And in all experiments, we have to understand uh, the impact. So you need a very good baseline. And the IPCC and other uh, mainstream organizations have a tendency of using different baselines. Or I think part of it is because uh, they didn't have as reliable um, thermometer data uh, prior to, I think, 1850. So they chose to use that interval of time as uh, a more accurate baseline to from which to measure. A high precision baseline. Yeah, a higher precision baseline. Yes. Another thing I picked up from our conversation yesterday is that in your efforts to educate the community, because essentially you're almost fulfilling a bit of a social function to educate the kids in the community and give them opportunities to learn more about science. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yes, indeed. So I mentioned that uh, the kids are very curious about wi what we do and for sure also about the sensors. So we decided to just uh, in the process of uh, interfacing with them, also invite them in to our workshops and offices to look at how we do our work. 
and also to participate in some workshops and try the processes out themselves. And uh, people, including both you know, young people, they're looking for jobs. There's a very little uh, opportunity for the young people. And uh, those fortunate enough to go to university are also not really able to learn anything uh, substantial from their schools. I think universities are mostly focused on making sure that everybody pays their fees so that they can issue, take all the boxes and issue diplomas at the end of four years. Just as an example, many schools don't start their session until like November. And then you can imagine maybe three days a week they have three lectures and then most people, university students are not really spending much time uh, in lectures or schoolwork. So the university system in Sierra Leone doesn't really uh, function as you would expect in um, other parts of the world. So you can imagine those are the lucky 1%, you know, who gets to go, to go to university, but the vast majority uh, are barely finishing middle school, high school. So people do not have access to uh, scientific education or STEM education. And I think the least that we can do is to help them understand enough and to utilize resources that they have access to, observably, uh, quantifiably improve their lives by both building gadgets that can help them in their daily function and also maybe uh, express themselves in art. So maybe I'll, I'll show just a few uh, objects that we're recently starting to, to model. Well, let's start with the, the art um, object. So, so over here, uh, this is a, a cup and a, um, painted by a local artist after we have made it from a, um, a PET bottle. So it's, it, it has a pretty stable base and uh, to achieve the different diameters, we have to use uh, several techniques, including pressurizing the bottle during a thermal expansion to achieve the large diameter. We have to uh, fold over to achieve an inverted base, so it's uh, very stable. And we have to then uh, also use another shrinking mode of the uh, outer diameter, which matches the diameter of the cup, the liquid containing portion that you want to achieve. So in the process, if we show this to kids, they will get some intuitions about how different materials work. They will get the sense of how air pressure works, a sense of how different plastics behave under different thermal treatment, and we'll see unav uh, avoidable melting of the plastic sometimes, and also how do you get uh, really uh, highly, uh, tightly stuck plastic from a, a mold. So there's different techniques we use, for example, lubricants, or use molds that have a spiral shape so you can basically screw this away from the mold. We human beings, we, we are evolved to observe the world and get intuitions just from observing. So the first step to really building a scientific understanding, I think, is to just get your hands dirty and to work with material. So that's one of the one of the aims. So that's a very simple object. And this was made by one of the younger people that you were sort of instructing in science, and you showed them how this was made and the whole thing. Our team in Freetown consists of roughly ten young uh, university uh, graduates from the past year. So. Over this roughly a year, I've been training them in different fabrication methods uh, and also uh, the basics of uh, data management, data taking, and data analysis, and uh, Python and programming for graphing. So they're uh, slowly... I like Python. <laughs> I, like, I use a lot of Python myself, so it's a good, uh, useful language. Yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> so this is the work of two, two individuals, or maybe uh, a team of three, but one person actually operated, and then there's the artist we recently recruited who did the painting. Using the same process, you can even change different process parameters to result in different shape cups or bowls. So I think we will link, uh, uh, show a picture of that in, in the actual video of the different form factors that you can achieve oh yeah, we'll using we'll in the, the uh, same process. So that's a simple device. But uh, using some of the same techniques, you can really, it's like its own programming language. We can build other things that's useful. So now let's take a look at uh, this gadget. It's essentially two bottles, one encased into the other. And uh, the inner bottle uh, is uh, punctuated with a lot of holes. And the way we make them is very simple. You just heat up a soldering iron <laughs> and then you quickly punch them. It takes uh, like 10 minutes to, to make those holes. And uh, the function of this one is uh, it's essentially a, a tea making cartridge. You can put you know, tea leaves in there and hot water and then after some uh, steeping period then you're uh, tea, tea comes out the bottom end, filtered. So some people might be uh, curious uh, or concerned about putting hot water on plastic. So don't worry, we preheat treated the plastic so it already has undergone uh, a brief boiling. So it's, 
its form will not change uh, when you put boiling water in it. So it, it's been stable. It will be very stable. If anybody knows how to handle plastic, I would guess it's you with all your education in material science. So that's really cool. Well, I'm also learning myself, yes. right? Because uh, I was trained in semiconductor fabrication technologies and making a you know, chip very precisely using photolithography, electron beam lithography. So it's not exactly the same. Soft material <laughs> is not really my specialty. And then using those cartridge, we can make more advanced devices such as a, a thermos. This is nothing but the cartridge that's shown before encased in two additional layers of convection and the radiation shields. And 100% of this uh, material used is uh, from the, the bin. So it's the discarded resources that we are utilizing to make something that's of value. And we've done thermal measurements of this device and can keep water to above 50 degrees for about four or five hours, which is uh, sufficient for daily use and is comparable to commercial thermoses. So uh, would that serve as a, uh, as a water purification device in a less affluent country? Would that be something that people could use to uh, make brackish water potable? Uh, this particular device is just for storing hot water. Uh, in um, places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or regions with abundant sunlight, you can produce hot water during the day and uh, keep it hot throughout the evening. So you can wash at 12, 1 a.m. if you wanted to with hot water or have a hot tea before you go to bed. So it's just a thermos, right? Okay. And it's also useful in um, you know, more affluent uh, countries as well. I mean, it performs the same function. And I'm sure there's more people who are informed about plastic pollution issue. And that's one of many ways to upcycle plastic waste into something that most people would find useful. But uh, you mentioned desalination, but we'll come to a, to a, in a minute. So over here, that's uh, another related to the device, uh, which is uh, the inner uh, bottle that is now covered in black plastic. Uh, it's just a black plastic bag, uh, thermally shrunk and holding tightly onto the inner core. So that when sunlight impinges onto it and it becomes heat, the heat is more readily transferred via conduction into the bottle to heat the water inside. So uh, we made a bunch of devices like that, and we, if you just leave it them outside in the sun with the sunlight, the water can reach 60 degrees Celsius after maybe three hours. And uh, there are studies showing that once water reaches 60 degrees Celsius, instantaneously 99.99% of the germs and bacteria and viruses decompose or die. So it's a rather efficient way to sterilize water. And I have to say that the main inspiration for this project, it's a diversion from our main work to cool down using mirrors clearly. The inspiration is the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Gaza, uh, where people are deprived of access to clean drinking water and also fresh water. So these devices and their extensions are to address the water safety issue when you already have fresh water. So just to not confuse people, this device on the bottom is just nothing but a cup. It's just a nice way to, you know, to keep things so I can both have my brewer and also something to drink from. Right now, I just have coffee. Because it's a tea maker, I try to keep it clean, uh, free of milk. Right. So I, I just put the just tea up. There. So uh, to desalinate water, uh, we're just starting in prototyping on that project. We don't have a, a fully, uh, um, say, industrial scale or neighborhood scale capable unit yet. So it's a more or less a demonstration device. Uh, what you have here is a inner tube that's open. So the other one, remember, um, well, actually, they're both open, but this one has a uh, really defined opening to enable efficient evaporation of water on from the inside to condense onto the outer surface, which is uh, cooled by air convection. So the inner tube absorbs sunlight, heating the water in that column. And because warm water is lighter than cold water, there's a natural strat uh, stratification going on which prevents mixing. So that confines heating to the upper layer. Water from the uh, upper like a hot water section, tank. yeah, and then evaporates and then condenses down. So this device, uh, when we have tested, provides about you know 50 to 100 milliliters of water per day. It's from seawater. In from sea water. Wow. It's insufficient for uh, a human consumption, as I mentioned. You need probably like 10 of these devices to keep a person alive. 
but it's uh, potentially scalable. We can absolutely consider uh, putting an array, say five by five of these, uh, uh, measuring maybe one meter by one meter. That would be sufficient to keep one person alive if they only had the seawater as the source. And the water, in principle, should be sterile. So it should be safe to drink directly. So you can bypass the, the solar heating step. Now, uh, from what I understand, a lot of these little projects that you're doing, are they intended to eventually give you additional sources of, of revenue to support your research? Or, or what is the main driver behind you developing these uh, devices? The main driver are to help people who have the most urgent need for such devices. That includes people in, in Gaza, in other disaster areas, who have no access to advanced desalination equipment or energy other than the sun, and the, the many plastic bottles that I'm sure <laughs> litter the ground everywhere in the world, except for maybe in Europe and US where they get burnt or landfilled. Right? And yeah. So it's uh, to enable, especially regions that are prone to disasters in the coming years and decades, to have a way to uh, ensure that the people impacted can uh, save them and help themselves. So that's the primary driver. The secondary driver is in the Freetown context. We're hoping to uh, couple these gadget making to artistic expression to make useful objects that are appreciated in Western countries. For example, I'm sure many hikers would appreciate these water bottles and the sterilization devices on their hikes. Who knows, maybe it, it could save, save their life on their hike, right? And for these products, we would like to form a worker-owned enterprise to empower the women and artists who work on making them. So they would be handmade and they would uh, each be accompanied by signature of the artists who and artisans who, who made them. So it's one way to get revenue to uh, help people gain basic access to clean water, food, and education here. And also maybe a small part of the revenue coming back to Mir to help further R&D of these resource upcycling ideas and projects. But the eventual goal is to help convert small communities, villages, towns away from uh, this top-down owned capitalistic system to one a transitional version of worker-owned enterprises, where people have the know-how to provide for their most basic needs, that includes water access and the food security. So those are the driving forces. Of course, if that could help us continue doing the in innovation through some financial benefits, that would be a, a plus, but that has not been the primary focus, though we may have to go down <laughs> that route uh, as, yeah, let's see, we haven't done our initial funding rounds. Okay, well, thank you for um, enlightening us on that. And, you know, I, I'm sure maybe a question that many of our viewers might be curious about is, is um, and maybe it's obvious, is, is the your hat. Can you talk about your hat? I think it's a great conversation starter. <laughs> so the idea for a, a hat came, uh, you know, from, from last year. I had a similar shaped hat if you looked at the video, but it didn't have this mirror thing. But on the last day, I literally put some tinfoil on it <laughs> and on that day I got approached by three news agencies trying to talk to me so it was a great conversation starter so this year we actually uh, put a slightly bit more effort and put some uh, mere sheeting onto it just to as a conversation starter and uh, to s discuss you know sunlight light reflection and also uh, energy capture so on the other, other side we also have mirrors so if I inverted it I can show people the basic geometry of a solar concentrator for energy uh, capture. So if you want to increase the efficiency of these devices, uh, you can just put it, plug it into one of the, the concentrators then. Just turn the hat upside down yes, and put yes. the bottle in. Yeah. yeah. Or you can make similarly shaped concave cavities and then improve your thermal efficiency. Uh, so that's the, those are the, the main reasons for that. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Tao. I'm gonna just ask one more question. We spoke with you in 2022, and now, thankfully, we have the opportunity to talk to you now. What are your plans, say, looking out over the next year? What do you hope to uh, accomplish? We are very ambitious right? uh, as to whether we can accomplish all of the, the plans uh, that's <laughs> up to fate. Um, 
first of all, we want to set up the uh, instrumentation measurement network for the community skill uh, project. I already mentioned that we're setting up a three-dimensional temperature sensing array for external temperatures. But we also need to understand the, the driving factor that's causing those temperature impact, which is the albedo of the, the neighborhood. So we have to deploy albedo meters uh, that provides um, constant time series of the albedo evolution of the, of the neighborhood. So we are also developing balloon-based sensors to provide that uh, uh, constant measurement. And uh, so that's a rather serious R&D project that we're pursuing. And we, we hope to complete that in the next uh, couple months and start deploying also albedo meters in addition to the, the temperature sensors. Like one of major learnings from this uh, reflective surface urban heat island adaptation field is that it's generally not a good idea to put reflective surfaces below pedestrian level. The reason being that you might risk redirecting light onto people's bodies, increasing the radiant energy that individuals are experiencing. And that has led to confirmed degradation of thermal comfort. So in order to make sure that the uh, albedo enhancement we're doing locally is not contributing to people's discomfort, we also need to install an array of radiation sensors at the people's height level to monitor street level changes in both shortwave radiation and longwave radiation. So that's also another sensor network that we're trying to uh, install and complete. So for the neighborhood project, we're hoping to complete sensor installation so we can start gathering the, the background because we mentioned you know the background, having high precision measurement is uh, extremely important when you're trying to do science. As what are you comparing against, right? So that's the hope for the neighborhood experiment. Another ambitious goal is to start a medium scale water evaporation suppression experiment in the field. So that one would take place in Senegal. The idea is that through much of the Sahel in the south part, they do get a rainy season. So in a rainy season, you can have flooding issues and other problems, runoff issues, erosion issues. But very soon after, uh, a combination of runoff, drainage, and especially evaporation returns that water to the atmosphere and the oceans. So you're left with drought. And our current strategy or hypothesis is that if we constructed small, shallow reservoirs that are feasible to dig using combination of small machinery and human labor, we collect water in those small reservoirs, maybe 10 feet deep, a few couple meters deep, and cover them with floating mirror arrays, then we would be able to prevent the evaporation loss of that precious rainwater. So it's a rainwater collection in small scale uh, reservoirs with protection from evaporation by floating mirror arrays. So we want to start the infrastructure construction for that experiment in the following year. And hopefully we will be able to start measurements in the, the following year. So a lot of background work to be done in 2024. And uh, data should be coming in in a meaningful way uh, thereafter. That sounds uh, really exciting. and. One question on my mind is um, how you came to choose to do your work in this particular area. You mentioned Sierra Leone, and, and what kind of got you going to this area to do all this work? There are several reasons, uh, and they all contribute to making this decision. One of the reasons is that when you're trying to make a future impact, we need to understand where the future is going. The future of humanity is one of scarcity in energy and the resources. So whatever solution or adaptation technology one develops, it needs to be able to function within the context of extreme poverty, resource paucity, and energy deprivation. And there's no better place than the most economically challenged locations in the global south, including Sierra Leone, Freetown Sierra Leone. So that's one motivation. Secondly, Sierra Leone is blessed to have one of the few chief heat officers around the globe, Miss Eugenia Carbo. And uh, basically her work in trying to provide shading for women, uh, small vendors in the streets, uh, drew our attention to Freetown in, in the first place. So that's another reason why we thought, okay, Freetown among the different global south cities uh, could be a suitable location. Well, Dr. Tao, thank you so much for joining us here once again 
in 2023 at the Climate Emergency Forum. And uh, I hope we can look forward to talking to you again next year and getting uh, further updates on your progress. You know, we thank our viewers for tuning in and learning about MIR. Uh, if you want to know more details about MIR specifically, we have other videos on the channel, which we'll include in the description. And uh, if, if you're a newcomer to this channel, uh, do subscribe and uh, like the video. It helps us with the algorithm on YouTube. Once again, Dr. Tao, thank you very much. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Climate Emergency Forum.